Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Q and AMP live event with Darren Beasley. It's an absolutely beautiful day here today in Sydney, and I'd like to start with an acknowledgement of country. AMP acknowledges the traditional owners, sorry, custodians of the lands, waters, and communities here at Circular Quay in Sydney and around Australia. We pay our respects to the traditions, ancient protocols, and cultural practices of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples who have lived and cared for this country. We extend that respect and recognition to the elders of this land, both past, present and emerging. I'm Lara Bergignon and I run our superannuation retirement and investments business here at AMP. Today I'm really delighted to have with me Darren Beasley, our Head of Retirement Solutions at AMP Capital, who's going to discuss managing our retirement plans, particularly in the light of COVID-19. As I mentioned, Darren's the Head of Retirement Solutions and a Senior Portfolio Manager in AMP's asset management business. He contributes to research, portfolio construction, asset allocation and implementation across the group's broader set of multi-asset funds. During the course of today's presentation, we really encourage you to participate in the Q&A by using the Q&A section on the right hand side of your screen. So thank you for joining us today, Darren. To kick off the discussion today, I can still recall um, about 12 years ago when my parents were planning for their retirement and the GFC hit. They had just sold their house, which was in fact the means by which they had saved and invested it all in the share market. And it was incredible, incredibly stressful uh, for all of us watching um, their savings that they'd spent many years accumulating, just seeming to disappear uh, almost overnight. Fortunately, they, they wrote it out and they're now enjoying their retirement. But it certainly uh, highlighted a number of important considerations when planning for your retirement, including that markets don't always go up. So what can you share with our clients today uh, when they're thinking about their retirement? Thanks, Lara, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, sadly, as we all have seen at some stage, Lara's story about her parents, while it's unique, is actually also very common. Uh, over the past 30 years of compulsory super in Australia, funds on, on, on average returned 8% per annum. But within that time, there have been months, years, and even decades where just like Lara's parents, outcomes, their outcome has looked nothing like that average. Individuals experience vastly different paths than the average. In some cases, this challenges and jeopardizes their livelihoods in the future. We have a lot to talk through today, but up front, I want to get across my main message about retirement planning. We can't rely on averages. You on the line approaching retirement or in retirement will not get the average return each year. You are not the average person. Your goals differ. Your wealth and your health, your lifespan is very unlikely to be close to that of the average life expectancy. So in planning retirement, I want to emphasize today why we need to consider the extreme scenarios like we've just seen in 2020 that could play out in our lives and to ensure that our retirement strategy can still deliver on our objectives if and when we live that non-average retirement. Darren, 2020 surely is one of those extreme scenarios. I mean, COVID's affected our lives in so many ways and will likely have lasting impacts on society. What, what's been the impact of COVID on retirement plans? Thanks, Lara. So there's been many impacts, social. Uh, I'm dialing in remotely right now. Uh, there's been impacts on how we socialise, how we shop. In terms of your retirement plans, I've listed four here today. So the, the first is the most visible, and that's that huge volatility we saw in the market in February and March and the subsequent rebounds. So let's explore that and see what that means to our retirement plans and our retirement income. The other very visible and uh, public, publicly discussed event was the early release of super scheme, which allowed people to access up to $20,000 of their super. The, kind of second layer down to COVID, but very important, is the acceleration of lower interest rates in response to weakening growth, and also lower dividend yields, uh, lower government bond yields, lower corporate bond yields. 
And lastly, one we'll explore quickly is the behavioural shifts this may have created. Uh, the anxiety when people were watching their balances bounce around. Listeners on the line, we've got Q&A at the end. It'll be interesting to hear if there's others that you would put in your top four that I've missed here. What has impacted your retirement plans? Um, it'll be inter interesting to chat about that later. I think the issue with these four events and when we watch them is that it's very hard to conceptualise and translate what this actually means for you. What has this done to your retirement income? You see your balance move 10, 20%. Does that actually mean you have to cut back $1,000 a year, $5,000 a year? It's hard to contextualise. It's that problem of translation. So to give you a better understanding today, I'm going to break one of my rules and use a very average person, the most average scenario uh, I can think up to illustrate what these events mean for this particular illustration. And once again, you are different and your experience will be different, but I'm going to take uh, the average salary and I'm going to have someone accumulate wealth from 20 years old up to 65. I'm going to have them earning a typical superannuation return every year. And I'm going to have them retire and spend $60,000 a year earning a typical retirement fund return and exhaust their capital if they live to 95, which they, uh, they believe is a conservative enough estimate. And then I'm going to overlay these events to this typical scenario. I'm going to test what if COVID hit at the age of 20, 25, 30, all the way up through and just see how this impacts across these events impacted you depending on what age you are. Because the impact of these events is very dependent on you. And that's a message I want to keep iterating through the next section. So moving to talk a little bit about this market crash from peak to trough. We saw Australian equities fall 36% and we also saw global equities uh, hitched into Australian dollars also fall 36%. As we know, this is a large part of uh, most people's superannuation and retirement investment plans and the average super fund and also typical uh, retirement fund fell in the range of 20 to 25%, some, some less than that, some more than that. I'm generalising here but we did see our retirement balances drop, peak to trough quite significantly at that time. Below is a chart that is fairly basic. It's just that person I was talking about, um, and this is, their, this is their retirement savings. So they start at 20, they're contributing, uh, they're saving up, and they get to retirement and they draw into their capital. And see, I've put a little dot here. I've illustrated that if COVID hit at this person's age of 40, uh, it was a 20% decline, and then we have the market recovering the years subsequent, so they actually recover their balance. I also sh now show that uh, if we then test that same 20% fall in this person's balance due to COVID later in life, even though the market recovers, uh, their balance doesn't quite recover to that solid line, which is the illustration if COVID never happened. That might be a bit confusing, but we're going to unpack this a little more. So we're going to actually talk about how much would someone need to adjust their retirement income if any of these, if at any of these ages was when COVID hit. And once again, I want to re-emphasize this is including the recovery in the market afterwards. In this, in this modeling, to make it clear of that impact, I show that, I, I, I calculate that recovery occurring over 10 years. In reality, the recovery happened much quicker than that, and we'll discuss uh, more about that later, but this is basically capturing the impact of volatility. The average return over the period for, the, for uh, this illustration is the same. We're testing a 20% fall and then a, uh, a um, slow recovery. You'll notice that the dispersion in what this means to different investors at different ages highlights one of the reasons why we need to focus so much on risk in retirement. This is known as sequencing risk. For investors in their 20s and 30s who have very low balances uh, and therefore less to lose when the big negative shock happens, such as the GFC, the tech wreck, or in this example, COVID, they have little to lose and they continue to contribute into their super. So they actually benefit from the subsequent outperformance or recovery of markets. So when you're young, it's almost like a big sell-off actually helps you get into cheaper markets. 
But if this shock, shock happens later in life, around the point of retirement or in early retirement, we have the highest balance to suffer that loss, but also because we're typically drawing out some capital on top of our income to support our retirement, those retirement savings that we're pulling out never have the chance to, to participate in that recovery. So the impact of a shock, even if it, we, we see the market recover, is much longer lasting and permanent for those people in early retirement. Sequencing risk, it's a term I'm going to come back to a lot and it's something very important to manage in retirement and we're going to talk about solutions to these issues later. I think that would be great Darren because I think sequencing risk is really interesting but can you sort of start to just share a little bit of insight around the early release scheme? Yeah thanks Lara, thanks and we will come back to sequencing definitely. Uh, the early release scheme, what was it? As we know, we saw a lot about it on the news, but what it, what it ended up meaning to our super system is that Australians withdrew 35 billion in aggregate from their super in 2020 via the early release scheme. Here at AMP, we paid out 1.9 billion of that to our clients. And when people have lost their jobs and their livelihoods have challenged, uh, it's a different topic. Um, but I, I feel that's justified, that super in financial uh, hardship, it's warranted to be to give access. Perhaps some people exploited that um, and, and that's debatable as well. But what's this mean for various people at various ages? So using our same projection of this very average person, uh, the results on the screen highlight that for those younger people accessing their super, this has the greatest impact. And that's because when we withdraw 20K at our younger age, so here we've assumed the whole 20,000 was withdrawn. We don't have a number for 20 years old because they didn't have 20,000 in super at that point. But following that, we test pulling out the 20K uh, and then um, what that means in terms of the adjustment they need to make to their retirement income. And you can see for that 25 year old, taking out the $20,000, foregoing all that compounding over the subsequent uh, 40, 50 years of their superannuation investment before they start retirement, that is very detrimental to their retirement income. The amount you'd need to adjust that retirement income to still have uh, an income till that target age of 95 in this case is three and a half thousand dollars. And you can see that becomes less impactful as you uh, move later in life. So this is echoing that message that we're all very unique and the impact of these different events depends on who you are, depends on your wealth and your age, and so on. It's not all bad news though, uh, as I say in the bottom left there, for, this will depend on your income, but for this particular person who earns the average Australian income of $86,000 a year, they had to only increase their contribution rate into their super from 10% to 13% for 10 years. So once again, that's a 3% increase in their contribution rate for 10 years, and that got them back on track as to the point where if they never took out the $20,000 during COVID to begin with. So there are solutions and we can talk, we're going to talk a lot about solutions in the back half, but I just want to uh, give that one there. The third, m moving on to these, uh, along through these four issues that we're talking about today, sorry, is the acceleration of a trend that's been happening for the past 10 years already, even longer. And this is a big one. It's the acceleration in lower interest rates and lower government bond yields. Also what we've seen in COVID is also uh, dividends being cut, so the dividend yields are also being reduced on Australian equities. So overall, the yields on your retirement savings or your superannuation are going to be lower. When it comes to investing for retirement, the most common way to manage risk and we've, we've seen earlier how important managing risk uh, is around retirement. The most common way in practice to manage risk is to increase the proportion of what are called defensive assets in a portfolio. So if there's growth assets and defensive assets, when we're young in superannuation, the typical fund has about 70% in growth assets, 30% in defensive. It's very common when we approach retirement or enter retirement our growth allocation declines to manage risk and our defensive allocation, which is mostly bonds and cash, increases. What that means, however, and I'll explain this a bit further, is this approach is severely compromised if cash and bonds 
are almost giving a, a zero to one percent expected return. So on the chart here, just to back up that comment, I've got the yield of a typical defensive portfolio of global bonds, Australian bonds and cash. Uh, this, this is more uh, a passive index portfolio into um, uh, a mix of growth and defensive assets. This is what the defensive assets would be. And you can see there in the light blue is the yield. And it, it through most of the uh, 2000 to 2010 period was around 5%. And post the GFC, the last five to seven years, it's been around 3%. Now it's fallen an extra 2.5%. Uh, now we're looking at a 0.79% yield as of uh, Monday, I, I calculated that is your combined yield on your defensive assets. So if you've got a 50% defensive, traditional defensive portfolio and 50% growth, half of your portfolio is giving basically a negative return once you account for, in real terms, once you account for inflation. So what does this mean? It's harder to convey the impact of this, but I've assumed that this lower yield impact uh, plays out for, um, or this lower yield environment plays out for, for at least 10 years into the future. And it's hard to see how this low yield environment ends. It actually requires reflation to enter the economy. Uh, as you can see, this once again impacts the people in retirement who have a greater allocation to defensive assets the most and the greater sensitivity to their returns being lower. So this, once again, is severely challenging the typical way we manage risk in retirement. We're going to come back to perhaps uh, how we need to manage risk going forward as a part to our growth defensive split. <clears throat> and lastly, of these four uh, key events that we've discussed is these behavioural shifts. And look, since that 36 or 37 percent fall, Australian equities have almost fully recovered and global equities have recovered in full. So that's great news for everyone on the line and uh, it, it's, it means we have a chance now to, to reset our retirement thinking and our, and our, our planning. Um, some other points though, which are unfortunate, is that some people saw their balances falling in February and March and actually reacted uh, and switched their uh, their retirement strategy at that time. So we saw almost 5,000 switches into cash on our platforms, and that amounted to around $650 million. Uh, so that's a little over $100,000 on average per switch, some larger, some, some smaller. But this is the real problem, and this is what I'm lab labeling as behavioral shifts and behavioral risk. Uh, markets usually recover in this case, much quicker than expected. But for those who switched at that bottom and locked in those losses, missed the recovery. This is all obvious, but I wanted to point it out because it's one of the biggest, it, it, as you notice on the numbers here on the chart, if I simulate someone switching uh, at the low point and then missing out on that recovery, the magnitude of these impacts are huge. This is the largest risk out of any of the four that I've modelled. Once again, these are all illustrative only and don't apply personally to you, but it gives a sense to how important it is to manage risk before the fact and not react in the midst of a crisis. Easier said than done when this is uh, our livelihoods, but it's something we really need to remember and uh, uh, it's echoing the words of many or all planners out there um, advising their clients and something I, I know one of my colleagues, Shane Oliver, always echoes is, is stay on course and don't react. So I've talked through these four points and I've talked through these key takeaways. I'm going to list them here. I'm not going to go through them all again, uh, but this is basically for anyone who wants the slide pack later to reflect on the key takeaways. Um, I, I hope this gives a feel for the COVID impact on retirement plans. and I hope this gives a feel for the complexity of managing risk in retirement. I think um, now hopefully we can we can move on and, and maybe talk about some of these risks in more detail. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Thank you, Darren. I think you've introduced just the concepts there of sequencing risk and longevity risk. Um, also just talked about how 
important, you know, behavioural um, elements can be when planning. So can you help us now start to unpack those a little bit more and, and think about some of the, the considerations and opportunities for our clients? Sure, Lara. Um, so on this chart, we have that typical person. This is illustrative only, but this is someone earning the average salary contributing 10% and earning CPI plus 4% all throughout their retirement. They accumulate in today's dollars a million dollars by the time they hit retirement. So um, quite a, a great outcome. But this is once again is the average and I'm going to keep saying the average doesn't happen. No one's experienced the average um, in the path of their life. A few key risks I want to really focus on. And these are challenges that we need to address and talk about in retirement. They really should be at the core of many conversations in retirement planning. The first between 55 and 75 is sequencing risk and that's that term I used before to describe when we've got the most to lose and when we start drawing down on capital we have the greatest sensitivity to market volatility and large shocks such as the GFC, tech rec and more recently COVID. The second is that low yields are here to stay <clears throat> and this severely compromises the way we traditionally manage risk. If we if we were worried about sequencing risk or we were worried about market volatility, typically we'll just go more into defensive assets. That is really going to start challenging the how long your retirement savings are going to last because your return overall will be lower than it's ever been expected to be. That's an expectation. The last one and a more complicated one that we're going to explore is longevity risk. This is towards the end of our life and, and this really addresses the difficulty in planning an income stream until an unknown endpoint. In our previous examples, we we gave the example of this person planning to withdraw capital and only if they live beyond 95 would they actually exhaust their capital and fall back on only the government pension. But yeah, if you think about it, 95 seems very conservative. Yet as that individual ages, if they were a male, as they got to 80, all of a sudden, based on probability in current life tables, they, they have a 15% chance of outliving their retirement savings plan. If they're a female, they have a 23% chance at 80 of living beyond 95. Serious risks that need serious uh, response, but by the time we're 80, it's often too late. You've already eaten into most of your capital. You're already looking down at, at exhausting that capital by, by 95, and that is, that is if things have gone to plan. So how do we manage that? How do we deal with that? Let's explore that later. And the last one, and, and this is the big uh, combination of all those other uncertainties, given we don't know how, what our returns will be, uh, given we don't know the path of those returns, which we could deliver sequencing risk, given we don't know how long we're going to live uh, and how much we may outlive our expectations, we leave left with very little idea of how much we can actually spend each year. So the main uh, strategy around this historically is just to be very conservative. You know, those are uh, those kind of perceptions and myths of retirees going and splurging their their savings on caravans, holidays, uh, and and boats just ain't true. Um, there's a good study. Uh, it's about five years old now by Deborah Ralston at the CSIRO, who's now heading up the income retirement or retirement income review. And she explores this with a lot of data and just shows how conservative the average Australian retiree is. And maybe they do want to give their kids on average 30 to 50% of their wealth. Uh, but I would suspect the reason they're so conservative is because they're, they're covering themselves for the unknown. What if markets collapse? What if we live a very long time? What if we have extra health costs? How much can I spend as a function of all those other risks? And it's the biggest thing that I think we need to address. And I, I call that consumption risk. So these are the big challenges. Um, does your retirement plan address these challenges uh, to a degree? Um, it'll be interesting to hear people's thoughts on how these can be delivered. Um, we want to explore that at, at this point, I think. So, Darren, I'm sitting here and, you know, this is some um, what I do every day with you, um, but I'm sort of reflecting on no one being average. <laughs> 
I've got a little visitor, an extra contributor there to the conversation. Um, so no, when none of us are average, uh, and then we've all got to sort of consider sequencing risk, yields, longevity risk, and and how much can I spend? I, you know, I certainly think if you've been working hard all of your life, um, these are really, really important considerations. So how can how can we navigate through this? The, the dog was literally barking that whole time. It's just stopped, so it got your cue. <laughs> um, so look, we're, we're talking about managing risk and you know, as I pointed out earlier, sorry, that's, that's kind of, that could be a problem. Uh, we, we're talking about managing risk after the event. That's an important thing. And uh, once again, we can't be in the midst of a crisis and respond. We have to plan before. Um, the good news is COVID has displayed the quickest recovery we've seen uh, in almost all market collapses in history, other than maybe, maybe one. Um, so that gives us the chance now to think about these risks and reset, not at the bottom, but at the top. So at a very high level, what are the, what are the products that we can utilize uh, in retirement? And I've got the traditional ones at the bookends here, basically. So this is a risk versus return chart. And, and I'm putting this in the context of retirement. It's, it's the risk to your retirement income and the longevity of that income. And the return is basically the size of that income. If you get a better return, you can expect to be able to spend more or leave more to your kids or achieve more of your goals. So at one at the high end of that spectrum, and by far the most common approach is a managed fund wrapped in an account-based pension. Uh, the statistic from a couple of years ago I saw was 92% of Australians use an account-based pension uh, for their retirement savings. This approach is fully exposed to investment risk uh, and uh, the market ups and downs is the common approach you'd be familiar with. And the investor draws from this uh, true or managed fund uh, an account-based pension, a dollar amount that is at least or more that of the government regulated minimum, which is a percentage they just prescribe based on your age. So you put your money in a fund and you take an income based on a percentage or higher of that. And uh, that is the common approach. Um, you have very low certainty uh, via this approach. And all these risks I've talked about are really for someone in a traditional managed fund that you're exposed to sequencing risk and market risk and managing longevity risk um, is difficult because we're basically drawing down capital. And unless you're lucky enough to uh, not have to draw into your capital, which takes a very high balance in this low yield environment, you will need to eat into your capital and that's where uh, that longevity risk can come in. Also, on that, <clears throat> while we're talking about traditional managed funds, once again, the way we manage risk in those traditional, traditional managed funds by moving into more lower risk assets such as cash and bonds is severely compromised in this current environment. So I've got the arrow bot going down there that while it used to be low certainty, but you're rewarded with a higher return. Perhaps in the future, the aggregate of a 50% of a growth, 50% defensive strategy is going to be lower. At the other end, we have uh, a traditional life annuity, which gives guaranteed income for life, high certainty with no exposure to market risk or longevity risk. Um, often there is less flexibility, however, and accessing your money when you need it can be an issue or there could be costs involved. That, that is depending on the product. But particularly why people avoid traditional annuities and uh, modern day hybrids of annuities is because on a look through basis, the return is very low. And particularly in a low real yield environment that flows through the pricing of annuities. And if you compare your guaranteed income to what on average are expected by a traditional managed fund, the, the annuity just has that certainty, but is a lower income. So people, uh, people go for the traditional managed funds. But how do we actually compare these? How do we how do we say, well, one has a higher income on average, but exposes us to all these uncertainties and there's a percent chance I could be in a very un, un, undesirable situation versus taking a lower income uh, but having certainty around it. That's very difficult. That is very difficult. And given the low yield environment, given um, the rigidness of, of some of these approaches and the exposure to some undesirable attributes, we see a growing need and evolution of retirement solutions in a mid ground here. I'm going to talk through a couple of those. We also see a growing desire to layer and combine different products that manage risks to 
uh, address some of those challenges such as sequencing and longevity that we discussed earlier. So moving along, let's let's give this is just a couple of, of examples of where products in that middle zone may play a role. So I've got on the left here the, the challenge, how we typically address it, what may be the problem with that going forward, and then the, the alternative in that middle ground between those two bookends I just um, <clears throat> discussed. So the first is sequencing risk, you know, the risk of losing a, uh, or suffering a large uh, market downturn just in that 75, sorry, 55 to 75 range. The typical approach is to take less risk, to reduce your growth allocation. The problem with that is what else do you hold? Uh, you hold low yield, you hold defensive assets in the traditional fund, they're going to offer a very uh, low return. There's a couple of products that could address this and I'm going to expand on these in a second, but one is a guarantee. Uh, guarantees cost a little more in, in their structure, but they, labeled, they, they could potentially enable you to remain uh, or, or hold a larger allocation to equities and growth assets and the guarantee can protect against that sequencing risk. I will we'll discuss that in a second, or a goals-based fund. And I'll also explore a goals-based fund, but these attempt to give diversification and better risk benefits without relying on the traditional form of defensive assets. <clears throat> Another example is longevity risk. So typically we just don't spend too much. Uh, we, we save enough money to cover living uh, beyond where we would expect to live. The problem with this is typically then we, we are too conservative in our spending. We're missing the potential to live, the, the, the live out our retirement with that little bit more um, excitement, that extra holiday, paying for the kids, uh, the grandkids schooling, those things you want to do but don't because you're worried about the, the remainder of your retirement. The alternative is to actually almost ensure the risk of living too long by buying a deferred life annuity or a life annuity just to cover the essentials later in life and that can free up some of your capital to spend more money now. And lastly, consumption risk or, or how much can I spend? Uh, the, the government regulated minimum is probably the most common way to gauge how much or is the most common used method of how much to draw from a super, uh, super uh, sorry, retirement savings each year. There are other rules of fund, uh, rules of thumb. Um, so I know some large super funds have an example for a 6% of their initial capital uh, and so on. This is often too conservative and too rigid and not flexible to uh, the, the retiree's goals of spending versus bequests and, and ambitional spending versus essential spending. So the, the answer to this, I think, is really bedding down those first two risks so we don't need to be so conservative. Having a solution for sequencing risk, having a solution for longevity risk, and that gives us confidence to spend uh, a little more through our retirement to that target uh, target age where our, our uh, annuity income kicks in. So if we were to, fish, uh, sorry, before we get to that, um, I've touched on a couple of the products there. I, I want to be really quick on this. So if anyone has further questions on two of the funds here, the goals-based investing is the first one. There's a paper uh, that was written by myself uh, and that was on the back of a product we launched, which basically both the product and the paper explore how investing in retirement needs to be different. That when you're young, you don't have things like sequencing risk, you're less exposed to inflation risk, you pay a different tax rate, you're less exposed to behavioural risk. All this, I hope listeners on the line are becoming familiar with the, the amplified magnitude of these risks in retirement. So we built a fund that attempts to uh, uh, address these and we wrote a paper on how that fund works. That's called the My North Retirement Fund and the paper's available online uh, or through your advisor if, if you do use an advisor. Uh, the other one I quickly want to touch on is a guarantee. Once again, we're, we're running low of time. I want to get to your questions. A guarantee, you really need to read through the PDS to understand all the details of and, and risks of a guarantee. But in very simple concept, uh, you are reaching retirement. You're considering managing your risk by going down from a 70% growth strategy to perhaps a 50% growth strategy. So taking equities out of your portfolio and going more into uh, defensive assets like cash and bonds. Uh, if you're in an actively managed fund, there may be a tilt towards other alternative uh, alternatives or other defensive assets, but I'm talking about a very traditional index style uh, fund here. The guarantee may allow you to stay invested in the growth allocation. 
let's say 70% or even go up in your growth allocation to 80% and pay away some of your returns in guaranteeing if the markets collapse that your capital is protected. Once again, there's a lot of detail today and you'll need to read through or speak to an advisor about uh, the, the guarantees, but it's an illustration of some of these products that sit between those traditional bounds of lots of risk, lots of sequencing, a managed fund, an all in life annuity where you've got no risk, but low look through returns. There, there are solutions in the middle that are developing and we see more. We see more development uh, in this in this space. You know, just visualizing this back on. Uh, sorry, just let me catch up to where we are. So. Uh, as as an illustration of these, if we just yep, that's that's what, slide 15. Um, so as an illustration, utilizing these products, and I've got our, uh, our average person here on the screen accumulating wealth and then decumulating, these products might come in handy at different stages in life. Um, the, the guarantees address, address sequencing, so they may be useful in your pre-retirement and early retirement years. Uh, deferred life annuities address the, the later part in life, or oh, sorry, goals-based funds or greater diversification or more actively managed funds may utilize other forms of defensive assets or protection other than relying on, on those traditional means of de-risking into cash and bonds. And then lastly, uh, annuities or deferred life annuities may give that reassurance that no matter how long you live, there's an income being paid into your account. And that may give you confidence if that income starts at, for example, age 85, you can draw down your capital in your in your managed funds more aggressively to that point and then fall back on your life annuity income. So looking at this, I, I hope and I, I'm looking forward to some of the comments because I know we're going to get some feedback on some of this because a lot of it is um, is different. And I, I want to ask and, and now think about what what is the roadblock at this point to greater utilization of products that manage these risks? What is the greatest thing that's holding people back to saying, well, yes, I am concerned about sequencing risk. Maybe I can use some sort of bespoke tailored product to my needs to address this. Or yes, I am concerned about being able to draw down my capital uh, too quickly and outliving my savings. Perhaps these, there's a product out there to address this. And I think this is where it gets really interesting. And I want to go back to what I opened with. I really feel the problem with today's environment is that we rely on averages. It's the fallacy of average. On average, if we model out our expected return and our expected drawdown and our expected livelihood, none of these products stack up. On average, a straight out, unprotected, non-risk managed, managed fund wins. But if only, if only we could see the full range of those non-average lives that we are bound to, to take in our retirement, we may actually adopt a different approach. If we could see that if the full array of our lives paths in the worst 20% of those, we may be experiencing something that we conceptually feel is unbearable, maybe we'd be happy to actually pay a little bit away from the average outcome, pay a little bit away to manage risk, and then, in fact, we may be happy to slightly lower that average outcome, but have a far better poor outcome, if that makes sense. But it's very different. We don't we don't have the tools available to us. Um, look, I just on that last point before I talk about what what the future of these this sort of issue might look like. I ask, you know, what what do we pay away money for that we know is expected to not give us a positive return? life insurance, car insurance, house and contents. In this case, we're always happy to pay that premium, knowing we're unlikely to get the, any benefit back, but the small chance of that risk playing out is unbearable. So we, we pay that premium away. Yet some of the biggest financial risks in our lives beyond uh, you know, paying for a car are in retirement. They're sequencing risk, they're, out, they're, they're outliving our retirement strategy known as longevity risk. These are severely impactful events uh, we should feel perhaps uh, or contemplate paying a premium to ensure these risks away. It's going to lower the average outcome, but it's going to improve the worst outcome. 
I believe the biggest shift in the future will be a, a better recognition of the distribution of outcomes. Uh, it's 12.41, so I want to be quick here, but look, the, the best way, this is an Abraham Lincoln quote, and I, I like this, it's got many layers to what we're talking about here. The best way to predict your future is to create it, and this, in, in Lincoln's terms, meant take, take the future in your own hands, don't let destiny control you, you control destiny, and so on. But in this context, I'm saying actually, well, <laughs> and there's a bit of a nerdy angle of this saying, you can create the future by simulating, let's say 1000 different paths of what the future might look like. You can simulate the whole range of what your path of returns might look like, your cost of living, the various lifespan you may live, and you can test different strategies under all these different scenarios and compare how your retirement strategy holds up. And if you have a straight out traditional approach, the average will be highest. Uh, with, with, with no risk management or little risk management in there, a traditional uh, uh, you know, passive index uh, managed fund. But if you can see that whole distribution and somehow even potentially measure how painful the bottom set of those scenarios could be, we might start to change how we do things. We might start to think differently about lowering the average income and, and, and using tailored retirement products. We don't do that because at this time we can't measure that risk. We can't feel it. We can't contemplate it. Um, so we, we tend to ignore it. Um, you know, your house burning down is something you you know the dollar value roughly. You can picture it happening, so you ensure it. We can't get a sense for what these risks mean. And I've tried to give you some sense in our earlier examples today. But moving on to the the next slide, I I believe the biggest shift in the future of retirement planning. And how we approach risk in retirement is the intersection of these three important components. And these, these capture a lot. And we talked about the challenges of retirement, but the structure to address these will be greater use of products that are not traditional, things that address these challenges in retirement. These tailored products may in one form or another, and I've only listed a few, but there's going to be growth in this area and there's already growth globally. They're going to address, address the, the uncertainty you face in retirement of markets, the uncertainty of how long you live. But those tailored products, as I said, and this is the biggest point, can't be conceptualized without a greater improvement in technology. That technology needs to take your individual circumstances, your goals, simulate the world, your next 30 years, many times over, and tell you how your strategy stacks up and you can compare strategies in a more informed way. And I think what I've just said is quite complex, so that's where the role of advice comes in, to bring in those tailored products, utilising technology on their desktop to show, look, this is the average outcome and this is the traditional way of forecasting your what you can spend each year and how long it will last. But if we start to consider that all the scenarios, there are some really bad outcomes and, and are you comfortable with that? Do you still meet your goals or can we do anything about that? And look, I'll, I'll finish um, by saying I, I feel obviously AMP is a market leader in all three of these categories. Um, so we're, we're set to lead this future state, but we are working so hard to continue the rollout of these tailored products. As we speak, there's a relaunch of the guarantee about to roll out. I manage uh, some of the goals based funds and we're working to constantly improve how they manage things like a low yield environment. We're also working on the technology that's available at this point only to advisors, but maybe perhaps one day directly to the public through a tool called the Retirement Modeling Tool. And that's about to get relaunched with greater focus on what other strategies, bespoke strategies and tailored retirement risk management strategies and what that could actually mean for your individual circumstances. And advice, of course, uh, AMP has always been a leader in advice. So I'm gonna wrap up there and thanks for listening. Sorry, I went a little over time. I've left 15 for questions. Um, over to you, Lara. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Dan, for sharing some of your insights with us today. Um, I'll just give everyone some time to, to load up uh, any questions they might have. Um, a lot of what I see, Darren, is, is uh, and I guess maybe as a way of engaging people in their super, is to talk about the dollar value that's required um, as you as you start your retirement. Is there such a magic number? And if there is, what is it for a couple and for individuals? So 
there's many, there's there's a short answer and there's a long answer. I'll try and keep it short because I know I talk too much. But uh, look, you can you can go to the official uh, moneysmart.gov.au mm-hmm. and go to it after this call. Have a look at it. Uh, it's great because it's a tool and we need more tools in retirement. But it does all the things, unfortunately, that I've just talked about, which may be pitfalls. So you can go in there and punch in what your retirement balance may be at this point and see. Uh, what your retirement income, including government pension and a drawdown would be. But in that they have one return assumption and one constant return, and that's 7.5% is you can adjust it, but it starts at 7.5%. And they have one age that they start off with that you're drawing to, which is 90. And you put in, let's say a million dollars, like our example. I know that's a large balance by today's standards because not everyone's lived a whole life of super, but let's put in a million dollars because I remember that number because I just did it yesterday and it's $66,000. Uh, so that's not too different to the example we just had where I had my own numbers. If you remember that person drawing up their capital in today's dollars got to a million dollars and I assume $60,000 and they ran out at 95. This is saying 90, 66,000. There's a the field. So. I'm not going to say a magic number that may give a feel, but jump online and have a look at that. But be aware that that is all those reliance on averages are played out on that official government website. I'm not criticizing anyone, but we can do way better. We can mm-hmm. say what are the array of scenarios that may play out if your return isn't that? What if it happens earlier? What if it happens later? What if you live to 100, not 90? All those are very probable events. Yeah, it's a great actually segue into a question here from Grant, Darren. Because of retirees taking a conservative approach to to drawing down, do we expect a resurgence of lifetime annuities? So it's picking up on that point around, you know, knowing whether you've you've got enough or too much or not spending enough. Look, annuities is a very difficult topic. Uh, They're the government has changed legislation. So let's talk about one thing first, because annuities on a look-through basis do offer a lower return, uh, and that comes with risk management. So there's that trade-off on versus risk, uh, having greater certainty, uh, but having a lower retirement income, mm-hmm. versus taking a little more risk and having higher income. There's an idea, and this is put in uh, the 2014 financial services uh, inquiry uh, and it's being reiterated by Treasury when they're talking about their plans for the retirement system. It's basically combining or layering different products. So rather than annuitizing yourself for your entire period, which sacrifices some of your returns, perhaps it may be beneficial to have an investment account or a managed fund for the bulk of your retirement and buy an annuity that only kicks in if you live beyond when expected. So let's say you start at 65, you create a managed fund and you draw that down with greater confidence and a higher rate because you know you can exhaust it to a point where you only have left what you want to give away uh, or what you want to reserve for a rainy day. But then after that, your your government pension is subsidised by a uh, deferred life annuity. So the government talks about that literally in, in their papers and they also actually um, have changed the tax laws and asset test to make the utilisation of deferred life annuities uh, much more interesting. Uh, they still aren't being utilised. They still aren't being utilised mm. and that goes back to my point because we've got the models and I'm I, I, working on a, another white paper right now that can actually prove that even though your look through return is lower, on average you can achieve your goals and, and, and if you kind of score the matching of your goals, you can actually have a higher happiness or satisfaction rating if you barbell an account-based pension or retirement investment fund with a deferred life annuity rather than trying to drag that cash, that capital all the way out to some unknown age um, that you need capital to. So my answer is I think there is a role there. I think a lot of people who think a lot about retirement see the need, but we don't have the tools to explain why is this better for you? What does it actually mean in dollars and cents? And we're working on that and that's going to be rolled out in 2021, hopefully. That's great, Darren. It sort of links to another question that's been asked here um, and, and apologies, I'm, I'm assuming um, that I've got this right, so um, I hope I do. But 
You use the term there, look through, Darren, which I think you know means that really um, there is a cost to the annuity. That means that you, you're getting that certainty, but for a lower return. How how does an, an individual or a client get confidence that that on a look through basis the annuity is actually worth that lower return? So how how do we show value add there, um, and and how does a client get confidence that it's not just you know, excessive charging of fees. Yeah, that's that's a great way to think of it. And there's several ways we can slice and dice that. Um, the, the first thing you need to do is actually produce a whole set of scenarios that could play out in your life rather than one. Um, so once you have that, you actually then test how each set of strategies, whether it's just a managed fund, whether it's the combination as the question suggests, of utilising annuities, you then can test how your retirement income fares using those different products. And one might be very volatile and you might run out some of the time. Others you, you might be lower, lower volatility and, and less chance of running out of capital, but a lower overall level. This still comes to a very personal thing of trading off higher income versus the risk of running out versus lower income. How do you quantify that? And this is the challenge. There's some ways we could actually look at the probability of meeting your target and, and that could actually be a percentage. Or you could say, you know, in the worst 10% of outcomes, how low does my income get? And you could compare that to, you could visualize that right today. If, if the previous person I was talking about was 60,000, if there's a 10 or 20% chance they could fail to meet what the, their essential needs require, which may be, let's say 35 or 40,000, they may say, well, I just don't want to take that risk. Give me another strategy where I never or almost certainly never fall below an income of 40 or 40, 35 or 40,000. Mm -hmm. So there's this trade off. The one academically uh, most correct is to use a concept, which uh, people are going to um, kill me for bringing this up, but it's a concept of what's called utility. Well, that's a, a satisfaction score. Mm -hmm. So if you see all these paths, these 1,000 paths that people have lived through the simulation, and you can somehow measure their satisfaction through the, the reliability of that income, penalising volatility, penalising running out, you then get a score for each of these scenarios. The best average score actually takes into account the, the downside. And I, I may have lost some people there, but there's ways we could develop uh, communicating how to manage risk in retirement, uh, how to manage those scenarios that are uncomfortable. It sounds like a challenge for us, Darren. Um, so uh, watch this space on that one. Um, another question here from Gavin. How do you view investment in property as a mitigation strategy for drawing down on super and cash? And thanks, Gavin. Uh, look, I have talked a lot about um, advice topics today and retirement topics, but my skill is not in personal advice. And I think whether in Investing in a property uh, is right for you is very much individualised. You know, I know if it's their sole primary residency, it may open up um, or be very good for their asset test. So that that is very personal and and an advice driven decision. Uh, it it obviously allows. Yeah, it. I, I can't answer that. Uh, I mm. I feel without um, going into personal circumstances. Let's list the the properties or the the, the attributes of property that are favourable and or unfavourable. It often gives a solid income, but you can't tap into it very easily if if life changes. If you <clears throat> if you uh, have an accident or uh, your roof needs repairing, it's very hard to liquidate that as opposed to a managed fund. Um, the income is fairly reliable, um, and it may have uh, attributes that um, <clears throat> help your welfare. Um, and and the returns are quite and the returns historically on average have been very solid um so you know it may allow for greater leverage in some circumstances in super as well uh, but once again i'm probably going to defer that question to a more one-on-one -on -one advice style led conversation which i'm not the, the best equipped to go with no thank you darren i think we would all agree that not having your eggs necessarily in one basket is 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 a sensible strategy but very much um depends on personal circumstances as to to which um to which eggs are in that basket um a question i uh, she darren i'd be interested if you have any views on this but are you seeing people keep their money in super for longer to benefit from the future rise in value 
the 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 age you retire. The, so retirement age is not always a choice. Um, mm. So I guess that the type of question you're asking is uh, well. Well, let's let's just be clear. If, um, once you reach retirement age, uh, and once again, I'm, I'm not an advisor, but it is typically best to roll your super into an account based pension for the benefits of tax. And if you uh, wanted the same risk return profile as super, you can actually typically replicate the investment that you had in super in retirement. So the actual makeup of your investment style doesn't actually depend on whether you're officially in super or in pension. Uh, the tax rate does, and that leads typically most people to, to one to one direction. Um, if the question is actually more about retirement age, that is one of these things that once again, we struggle to translate. And if this uh, conversation wasn't so focused on COVID, it may be actually one of those boxes we had at the start, which are what are the big things we need to consider? Because retirement age, just delaying one or two years can have a huge impact. If I had, if I, our individual, I should have given them a mythical name at the start, it would have been much easier to keep referring to them. But if that individual, I could have modeled the impact of delaying retirement three years, the dollar value on the, on the positive side would have been significant. I don't know off the top of my head what it would be, but it's a very large lever to control. But unfortunately, a lot of us don't control when we retire. Mm. Um, I did, I, if I had a photographic memory, I'd quote the stat, statistic here, but it's quite shocking how many people are basically forced into retirement. Mm. You know, a lot of people physically can't do their jobs anymore. Um, mm. And a lot of people uh, are, are actually, you know, once, once they move on from one job, um, have to go into some sort of part-time or semi-retirement structure. So, um, yeah, that that's an interesting concept there. Yeah, no, thank you, Darren. Um, just last question um, is actually one that I can actually take on your behalf, Darren, and that's um, whether my North will ever be available to um, be used by you know, directly by clients. Um, certainly something we have looked at and continue to look at. I think um, given the breadth of the menu and the complexity of some of the funds there, it's it's still our belief that on, you know, in general, uh, it's better that people using My North um, have the support of an advisor, but it's certainly something that we're looking at. And as the market changes and uh, literacy and engagement in super and investments changes. Um, certainly, that um, you know that may well um, come in the future. So, um, I'm just conscious of time, and and I think it's it's time for a wrap. Um, I'd really love to thank Darren for sharing his insights with us today um, and for joining us. Please keep an eye on our newsletter for um, further updates on future webinars. Um, and it's really important um, just to remind you that to the extent that we can help um, you consider any of these different um, attributes or, or considerations as you move into retirement, um, we're here to help. So please feel free to give us a call. There are a couple of numbers on the screen there today um, and always able, you know, always here if there's anything that we can help you with with respect to super retirement um, or investments. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, very wish you a, a happy rest of your day. And I echo, thank you everyone. Thanks for listening. I hope, I hope the call's been of interest and have a great day.